it's almost impossible for me to visualize in my mind that 36 years ago I drove up here for that first lectureship. I've been privileged to be here for all of the lectureships, spoken on 35, and I cannot tell you how much I look forward to coming and being a part of this good work. It's a good work because of the planning of this congregation, this eldership, and the help of those congregations in the area. You know, there's a lot of things, a lot of uh, things have happened in those 36 years. A lot of wonderful, wonderful blessings. I look back, I was thinking today of those who are no longer here with us, I mean, in my mind's eye, sitting here, I can look out and I can see places that they're not here any longer. But they were an encouragement, and they, their work, their encouragement still continues on and on. I'm glad to be here with you. I'm thankful you're here this evening, and we're going to be looking at I See Who Put Jesus on the Cross. You know, there are times in the lives of a preacher that he does not feel adequate to present a lesson. And this is one of those lessons. It's awfully hard for me to comprehend who put Christ on that cross and why he would die for the one who put Christ on that cross. We want to read from Isaiah chapter 53. We've talked about it a number of times this week, but I want to read here verses 1 through 4. We'll talk about a few things and uh, ask or make the statement the cross was necessary and then speak as to why it was necessary. And then we'll look at who put Christ on that cross. Here in Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse number 1, there the Bible says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when he shall, we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we uh, hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him was stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. You know, Isaiah chapter 53 uh, is a chapter, if you read that, really read through that, you can realize the extent of God's love for us, the extent of the Lord's love for us. You know, the Ethiopian eunuch was making a journey back to Ethiopia from Jerusalem, a journey of about 2,600 miles. And he was on a road making that journey, and the Spirit sent Philip there to him. And Philip came to him as he was in the chariot, uh, and they began to discuss things from Isaiah chapter 53. We read that in Acts chapter 8, 26, down through verse 40. But in John chapter 12, notice there in John chapter 12 how that this is referred to. It says in John chapter 12, verse 37 and 38, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed. And of course we know that Philip began at that verse and began to preach unto him Christ. Why? Because Isaiah 53 speaks about the coming of Christ, what Christ would endure for mankind's salvation. And of course, the gospel was preached that day. The eunuch obeyed that gospel, and the Bible says he went on his way rejoicing. Now, when we begin to think about Isaiah chapter 53, it connects Christ's death with our sins. And I'll just briefly go through these verses, and we'll talk about them a little bit more later. But in, in verse 5, He was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. With His stripes we are healed. Verse 6, It was laid on Him the iniquities of us all. Verse 8, For the transgressions of My people He was stricken. Verse 10, 
his soul an offering for sin. Verse 11, he shall bear their iniquities. And then in verse number 12, he bore the sins of many. You know, we look and we've heard several times during this lectureship about Romans 6 verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now, if you take that and, and look at those, sin brings death, the cross brings life. That's what that verse is speaking about. The wages of sin is death, but there's life because Christ came into this world and died. I want us to look, first of all, in our lesson, the cross was necessary. That's the first point we'll have. Just a statement, the cross was necessary. Why was it necessary? Well, we've already made mention of man's sin. Under the old law, animal sacrifices were made. Over and over and over again, they would make those animal sacrifices. But guess what? Those animal sacrifices could not take away sin. They had to obey the commandment to offer them, but they were still not enough. It was not what God intended to take away sin. And if you stop and think about it, really stop and think about it, if those animal sacrifices could have taken away sin, Christ never would have had to die. But He did. Because those animal sacrifices were not effective in taking away sin. It had to come to the cross. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 12, there it says, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. You ought to underline that. Eternal redemption for us. Why would we say that? Because under those animal sacrifices, they were done year after year after year, all the way to the cross. But this is eternal redemption. Never to be, had to be done again. No sacrifice would be made again. In Hebrews 10, verse number 4, it just simply says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. It's not possible. It was not something that was in God's mind. In God's mind, there was going to be the sacrifice of the best sacrifice that could ever be given for any individual. And I, we're going to talk about that because it is an individual sacrifice. He died for all men. However, He died for me and He died for you. Now, we know in Colossians 2 verse 14 that that old law was taken out of the way and it was nailed to the cross. Now we live under the gospel dispensation, the Christian dispensation. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And we live in that time frame. We're in that dispensation, the gospel dispensation. Salvation did require a blood sacrifice. And Christ, Jesus Christ, was the only acceptable sacrifice. That's what we saw there in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 19, there it just simply says, with his precious blood, or the, with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Of course, we know that He was that Lamb that was without blemish, was without spot, because in Him was no sin at all. Nobody could ever take away our sins except the blood of Christ. It was necessary. As I said, in the old uh, system, there were those animal sacrifices made. They were not going to be able to take away sin, but the Bible tells us without shedding of blood there's no remission. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Without blood there is no remission. Christ gave His life's blood on that cross as a sacrifice for our sins. In Matthew 26, verse 28, 
If you'll notice in that verse, it says, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So you see, brethren, there is no uh, misunderstanding about what the blood of Christ was for. It was for the remission of sins. It was necessary. That's our first point. It was necessary. Blood had to be shed. And that blood was going to be the very best that could ever have been offered. Jesus prayed the price for my soul. But let's ask the question. Point number two. And there's only two points in our lesson tonight. Point number two is who put Jesus on the cross? And please underline that in your mind. Who put Jesus on the cross? Well, if you would ask people, many would say, uh, those with uh, great intellect would say, well, it was Pilate, you know. If you read history, you read that Pilate was on, and he was a, uh, a bloody ruler. And Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 through 24, it tells us what Pilate did. Verse 24, listen to what it says. It says, When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Can you imagine in your mind's eye this man turning and washing his hands in water and making the statement, I've washed my hands of this. I'm free of the blood. Question, did he have the authority to say, oh no, we're not going to crucify him. Pilate had responsibility. However, in his cowardice, he turned and said to the people, you make the choice. The Jews, many people say it was the Jews that crucified Christ. And of course, we know that they were part of that plan of, of, of crucifying Christ. In Matthew 27, verse 20, there it says, But the chief priest and elders persuaded, now underline that, persuaded, they persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Think about that. They persuaded the multitude. In other words, they were like politicians. They went around and talked about it. Here, let's take, let's take care of him. Let's do something to him. He is influencing our economy. He's influencing our lifestyle. Let's cry it for him. And of course, we know that's what was going to happen. But even in Matthew 27, verse 25, it says there, Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us. Now, if it stopped there, that would be enough. But they said, His blood be on us and on our children. What a sorry lot of people. Not only am I going to take responsibility, I'm going to pass it down to my children. Who would want to do that? But they did. His blood be on us and upon our children. And then there are those who would say the Roman soldiers were the cause of the crucifixion of Christ. And of course, they are the instruments that carried that out. John chapter 19, verses 23, 24. When you look at Matthew 27, verse 35, there it says, And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. Think about this. <laughs> every time I come to this, every time I read this, every time I study this, every time I have a lesson that's involved in this, and I think about Pilate. There was Jesus before Pilate. Pilate washed his hands. Then there was the Jews. What did they say? Crucify him. Let Barabbas go. And then those soldiers that physically took the life of Christ. Can you imagine what it's going to be like on Judgment Day for them to stand before the judge of all mankind? What's Herod going to think? 
all those Jews and all the Jews down to this good moment in time who still reject the Messiah. And then there's those soldiers who held him, who nailed him to the cross, who when he cried, I'm thirsty, gave him vinegar to drink. They're going to stand before that same man and be judged for an eternal home. That's hard to take in. Do you think they'll wish? Do you think they'll think a thousand times, why did I do that? Who nailed him to the cross? Again, we take the verse we've used and so many have used in this lectureship and a good verse never hurts to look at John 3.16. Never does hurt. Because in that we see the capsule of God's love for man and Christ's sacrifice for man. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus died on that cross. To whom, for whom did He die? Well, the Bible says for the world. That means everyone. But as I said the other night, we ought to make it a personal thing. I ought to think personally that Christ died for me. Put your name there. Think about it personally. Make it a personal thing because, my friends, He died personally for every one of us. And as I said the other night, I, I believe there's only one person in this world of all the multitudes of people that have come into this world. If one, only one person sinned, God would have sent Christ to die on the cross for the sins of that individual. <laughs> if you take and spell sin, what do you find right in the middle of it? I am in the middle. S-I-N. I'm right there. So as we think about who put Christ on the cross, what put Christ on the cross? We're going to be looking at the who, and I am part of that. You know, what do you see when you look at the cross? I mean, really, what do you think about when you think about the cross of Christ? I am fearful that so many times we read, we hear about the cross, and it's just words rather than an experience, an event that benefits me. It's not just words. When the Bible class teacher or the preacher or whomever the teacher is speaks about Jesus Christ on the cross, brethren, it's not just an event. And we ought to think of, you know, sometimes people may look back at history and think about uh, an event that took place in history and it just passes through their mind. And I'm afraid many times that's what happens when we begin to think about the cross of Christ. When we think about what Christ did for us. Now let's get on further into this. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 tells us that sin separates us from God. Remember we talked about the sacrifice that will take away sin. Isaiah 59 verse 1 and 2 says we're separated from God by sin. Also Isaiah 1 15, Micah 3 and verse 4. Also in, in John chapter 9 verse 31 when you speak about that. He speaks there about uh, we know that God heareth not a sinner's prayer. Why? Because we're separated from God and must be reconciled. Now here's what I want us to do. His sacrifice was vital for our salvation. And I want us to think about, I want us to think about who put Jesus on the cross. Who? Not Pilate. Not the soldiers. Not the Jews. But in reality, it was our sins. It was our sins that put Christ on that cross. So, back in your Bibles now to Isaiah chapter 53. 
And I want us to look at these verses a little bit closer in the time we have left. You know, I, I, I'm getting to the age I can't see that clock back there, so we'll just have to go, won't we? <laughs> in Isaiah chapter 53, I want you to notice with me there in verse number 5. Now, what are we looking at? We're looking at this sacrifice was vital for my salvation. Why? Because I sinned, Romans 3, 23. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, also verse 10, tells us we do sin. In fact, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 10, it says there, if we say we have not sinned, listen, we make Him a liar, and His Word is not in us. How can I make God a liar? Well, I can't. <laughs> I can just say I don't. But I do, because God said so. Look at Isaiah 53, verse 5. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. I want you to focus on that little phrase. It tells us there that the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. Well, first of all, the chastisement of our peace. You know, as we said, sin separates, so there needs to be that reconciliation. Sin disrupts my relationship with God thereby disrupting my peace with God. When I look at other passages, like in Ephesians 2.14, the Bible says He is our peace. But in James chapter 4, verse 7, there it speaks about the peace of God that passeth all understanding. What kind of peace is He talking about there? The kind of peace that passeth all understanding. He's speaking to the Christians, Paul writing from prison. Here he is in prison. And he's saying there is a peace that passeth all understanding. What? The world cannot understand the kind of peace we have in our reconciliation to God by the blood of Christ. By His blood we can have peace with God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, here the Bible says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciled the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Look at that. How are we reconciled? Well, we're reconciled by the blood of Christ. And that's where the denomination was that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He died on the cross. But this verse we just read there, it says, and hath committed unto us the Word. We're reconciled to God because we study and obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many people today say, well, you don't have to repent. God knows your heart. He's going to forgive you. Jesus said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. And then he goes on to verse 5 and says, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Repentance is something we have to do. And we do that because we study the Word of God. That brings us to an understanding about the blood of Christ. It brings us to an understanding about what baptism does. Puts us into that blood washed in his blood. And I said to Saul of Tarsus, Now why tarriest thou rise and be baptized, washing away thy sin. He wasn't telling him to go take a bath. He was telling him to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sin. So we look back to, to that verse, verse 5. He, he brought to us that, that chastisement of peace. And then you go on down in verse number 5. Listen to what that says. With His stripes we are healed. Healed. Spiritual healing. Because of sin. By His stripes we are healed. He struck down the malady of sin. In Matthew chapter 13, and verse 15. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. 
What's he talking about? He's talking about the malady of sin. The wages of sin is death. But what God brought to us and gave to us through Christ will heal us from that. In 1 Peter 2, verse 24, I want you to notice that with me. In 1 Peter 2, verse 24, it says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness. Now watch. By whose stripes ye are healed. You ought to look that word up. You know, you look at stripes. You look at bruises. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? I, I fell down the stairs at the, at the Williams Manor. <laughs> Got a bruise on my elbow. But it's not the bruise that we read about in the Bible. We've all had stripes. This word stripes, Vincent says... This word stripes in this verse means mangled flesh. Another one said it was that which covered the body. Now, when next time you read about stripes, by whose stripes you are healed, think about what it really means. The mangling of his flesh. Why? Because I sinned. You know, I really do. I really wish I had the ability to cause people to look at this in a personal way and not look out, uh, think of it as, as, as a, uh, a worldwide sort of thing, but look at it as a personal thing. It's going to be personal at judgment, so why not make it personal now? What? Or who put Christ on the cross? My sins did. Your sins did. Verse 8 just simply says there, He was cut, uh, Isaiah 53, 8 says, He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was He stricken. Again, look at that. He was cut off. He died. He was killed. Why? For the transgression of my people was He stricken. In Acts chapter 8, verse 33, for his life was taken from the earth. And we've had, we've had such good lessons this week that brought us to an understanding of what that time frame was for the life of Jesus. I said a minute ago, I wish I had the ability <laughs> to cause some things to happen, to make it personal. For you and for me to somehow or another really truly see what Christ endured because of my sins, because of your sins. I, it's, it's, it's beyond, it's, it's beyond uh, description of what took place. Look at verse 11 of Isaiah 53. By the cross, I, I'm justified by that cross. He says, My righteous servant, servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. You know, you think about that idea of bearing iniquities. That means to, to carry my iniquities. And really, that really doesn't mean he carries them. It means he took them and removed them. He was the bearer of my iniquities. Where? At the cross. My iniquities. Whew. That's hard to comprehend. There's not one of us that has not sinned. Some of us have sinned much more than others. But those sins were born by Jesus Christ upon that cross to carry them away. I think about Psalm 40, verse number 2. Personally, it says here, He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, 
out of a miry clay. And what did he do? He set my feet upon a rock. I have a foundation to stand upon, brethren. The gospel of Jesus Christ. I can stand firm there. But you see, I have to build my life on that rock. We have a good example of that, don't we? Matthew chapter 7. The wise builder and the foolish builder. One built his house upon the sand. It wasn't any good. But the other built his house upon the rock. Trials and tribulations and storms came. Beat upon that house and it stood. Why? Because it was founded upon the rock. So when I look back at this and think about how we have been justified. Justified. You know what that word means? Justified. A good way to remember that, when I'm justified, it says, justified, never sinned. It's removed, it's gone. Not to be there anymore. Why? Why were those animal sacrifices year by year by year rolled ahead? Because they could not. They did not have the power to remove sin. But only by the blood of Christ. And it was my sins, it was your sins that sent him to that cross. It was my sins, it was your sins that caused him to cry out in agony and in pain. It was your sins and my sins that would cause him to cry to Eli, Eli, lam sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why did God turn away from Christ? Because of my sins. He took upon him at that cross. You know, you look at verse 12 of this reading. What does he say? He says, Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. What is a transgressor? One who disobeys the law. One who goes away from the Word of God. Brethren, that, that's why when we talk about it being a personal thing, you have to take on that responsibility of understanding what Christ has done and also going and taking the responsibility of preparing yourself for the trials and tribulations and the temptations that come your way. Those things that would carry us away from God. You know, do you ever think when you think of something you should not think do you think, you know, that's what put Christ on the cross? That kind of thinking? When somebody uses foul language to think, you know, that kind of thing, nail Christ to a cross. When there's gossip, when there's tail bearing, that's what put Christ on the cross. You can take and Think about adultery, fornication, murder, all of those. Down to telling something that's not true. Those things put Christ on the cross. But listen, He went to that cross so that those sins could be forgiven. Without the cross, we have no hope. You know, He intercedes for us. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8 says, But God commended His love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He endured the cross, endured the shame because of my sin. Because of my sin. How many times have I said it tonight? I wish you could think of it personally. Personally. Because it is a personal thing. Mike read a poem the other night. I want to read it too. 
He changed it, and I'm going to change it too. The poem says, For sin it was that slew him, and not the hand of men. Think then of the consequences of just one sinner's sin. I'll read it again. For sin it was that slew him, and not the hand of men. Think then of the consequence of one of my sins. Because that's the consequence of my one sin. You see, I already said, if I'd been the only person that ever sinned, Christ, I believe with all of my heart, would have come and died. But if I had ju committed just one little sin, I would need a Savior. Brethren, what we've talked about this week is a serious, serious matter. Because the Son of God died in agony because of what we do in our lives. You know, we have to really think about. You know, there's a passage over here in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 15. It says there about that unspeakable gift you know what that means? That unspeakable gift that He sent Christ on the cross? That unspeakable gift? You know what that means? That means you cannot fully describe it. They're not words enough of the greatest orator that's ever lived that could truly describe what the cross of Christ really means. We just need to understand our sins. Put Him there. But grace, the grace of God, the wonderful love of God, provided a means by which we can come out of that. The Bible tells us if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Aren't you glad we serve a God that loved us enough to make heaven possible?